All right. We'll check over here. Okay, are you ready? Yes. I, if you could speak just a little more loudly, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Okay, is this better? Yes, thank you. Okay. You're considered one of the best of the hard science fiction writers. Why is scientific realism so important in your work? I'm not sure I'm a good enough psychoanalyst to answer that. I just feel that uh, I have trouble writing something unless I can more or less convince myself that it might happen. Uh, the best example, I guess, uh, was my attempt a few years ago to write a story for a, an anthology of vampire tales. When I had finished it, I discovered that it was a science fiction story. I, uh, I just uh, I counted for everything that happened on a scientific basis, and I wasn't happy about it until I could account for them that way. Uh, a lot of your early work was uh, for John Campbell, is that right? That's right. Uh, he was noted for his want of science fiction accuracy. Did that shape the way that you wrote? Well, yes, very certainly it did. Uh, John was the one who brought my first several stories. I knew him quite well, uh, talked to him quite often. While I didn't always agree with him, we both felt that there were rules and that they ought to be followed. What kind of rules were those? Well, we I mean uh, rules of the universe. That We, we were both materialists, I guess. We felt that the universe does run by rule, and we felt that a story was most believable when it uh, matched those rules, at least as we, we mean humanity in general, uh, currently understood them. Huh. How did you get started writing? Rather gradually. I was reading the stuff originally. I started, I think, with the Buck Rogers comic strip, and I discovered there were magazines. Uh, I began telling the stories that I'd read in magazines to friends in the grade school playground and to Boy Scouts at campfires. Then I began uh, correcting some of the errors that I spotted in the stories and eventually began trying to write my own. In your novel, uh, Mission of Gravity, uh, that one's really noted for how you designed and built the world of mescaline. Am I pronouncing that right? That's right. How did you go about designing the world of mescaline? It was mostly slide rule work. A part of it was my contrary nature. I had read stories in which planets had extra heavy gravity, stories in which the planets had very light gravity, and it seemed sort of, of course, there could be no planet with uh, varying gravity, and I took the of course as a challenge. So I went to work. I, I am, as I say, a rather firm materialist. I have serious doubts in things like gravity screens anti-gravity machines. The only thing I could think of which would produce such a variation was rapid spin. And this was before you could steal time on computers because they hadn't been invented. I did a good deal of slide rule work and also some consultation with such astronomy text as I could get hold of. And I came up uh, with what seemed to be a valid planet at the time. There have been errors discovered in it since, I'm afraid. Uh. Uh, does that have reference to the afterword that you have in the book, Mission of Gravity, where you have the, what you call the game? Yes. Uh, some, somebody was playing the game. I believe it was a group of members of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Science Fiction Society, MITSFIS for short, and they uh, began taking Mestlin apart mathematically. I understand from some of them that the planet actually should, should come to a sharp edge at the equator instead of a smooth curve but I am not a good enough mathematician myself to check up on this point. Uh, well, you had some heavy guns there at the Massachusetts Institute yes, of Technology. Um, one thing I, I never was able, able to discover, possibly through my own error, how did the Mescalonites speak to each other? Uh, they used uh, a vocal language, sound. Oh, okay. They didn't breathe as we did. I tried to account for their having vocal apparatus by its developing from a swimming siphon, analogous to those of our own uh, squids. Now, this is in reference to a few things that I've read. Some people say that your alien psychology is too human, and then other people say that you create a very alien psychology. How do you go about developing the psychology for your aliens? Well, the uh, I am not sure, first of all, that uh, an intelligent being's psychology 
would be all that different from the human one anyway. It is going to depend on the being's motivation. So presumably, the creature will be driven so as to survive. He or she or it or they, if they have several sexes, are going to have drives to find food, to avoid pain. Uh, if they do have sexes, they will be have drives to use them, exercise them. And all of those will tend to provide motivation recognizably similar to those of humanity. I have a book that's just come out, The Nitrogen Fix, in which uh, my alien does not have a sex, and I spent a good deal of time trying to find uh, an alternative drive which would be as powerful. I think I found it, but I'm not going to go into that here. I'd rather you bought the book and decide it for yourself. Uh, the, the planning part, uh, depended on that belief, mostly. I felt that uh, the, the drives could be at least understood by a human being. For those people who say that my aliens are, are noticeably alien, not hu human, uh, in psychology, I'm afraid I have a rather cynical answer. My uh, secret for making a, a being seem non-human is to make him act rationally. For example, I can be fairly specific about this one, in uh, the sequel to Mission of Gravity, Starlight, at one point I had one of my mesclinites driving one of these giant tanks along uh, completely unknown territory. And nothing was happening. He wanted to get somewhere. And he gradually began going a little faster and a little faster, as a human being would do. Then he suddenly realized what he was doing and slowed down again, well, which is, of course, the rational thing to do. My own suspicion is that nine human beings out of ten would not have slowed down until they'd run into something. Um, uh, you had just finished answering that question about alien psychology, and you had mentioned the sequels, uh, or at least the sequel to Mission of Gravity. Start. Uh, was that I given the specific example for... Right. Okay. Uh, and I was fixing to ask you this question. Um, what caused you to write the sequels to both Mission of Gravity and Needle? In a sense, I was talked into it. I'm very uneasy about sequels and series stories in general. My experience has been reading them, but I was always disappointed by the later ones. I'd formed my opinion of what things were like, and the later stories usually uh, changed those opinions and disappointed me. The Mission of Gravity sequel came as a result of a conversation, I think, at one of the New York uh, conventions, a fan said something, and I can't now remember exactly what it was, which sounded like a good idea to use the Mastronites, and I built it up from there. I can be much more specific about the uh, Needle sequel. Uh, there was one particular science fiction fan who was always asking me when it was going to come out. Every time I met him at a convention, when is the Needle sequel coming, Hal? Finally, he changed his tactic. One fine day at a Philadelphia convention, he walked up to me and said, uh, Hal, you promised if I stopped smoking you would write a sequel to Needle. I've stopped. Get at it. Well, I had no recollection of ever making such a deal, but I couldn't uh, spoil any such uh, success story, so I got to work on it. Uh, not very fast, but I got a little done. Then I was telling this same story at another convention, I think at Toronto, two or three years later, and Judy Lynn Del Rey of Del Rey Books overheard me, and the next thing I knew, I had signed a contract. <laughs> so he got what he wanted anyway. He got what he wanted. It's the gent to whom the book is uh, dedicated. He just called me up a couple of nights ago. He's been out of the country and just got back, so I guess he's getting back into science fiction activities. <laughs> um, there's sort of a, uh, a tongue-in-cheek style that you have in that short story, Critical Factor, where the beings living in the earth beneath us are just as unaware of us as we are of them. Yes. What type of psychology and physiology did you come up with to develop a being like that that can flow through solid rock? It was written long enough ago now, so I'm afraid I don't recall all the, the details of what led up to it. I, uh, th the idea of having creatures not understanding or not being aware of others has been part of uh, my basic science fiction frame for a long time. I think it's a very likely sort of thing, though I don't like to go into anything as extreme as the fourth dimension. 
the uh, idea of something which could soak through rock, well, I have had courses in things like seismology, although I never specialized in any of the geological sciences. I know a reasonable amount of chemistry, and this just seemed like a perfectly possible situation to me. And uh, it was fun figuring out what would happen when uh, a creature like this encountered an open space where gravity could take over. Yeah, being that he had never felt the force of gravity before. Right. Which, of course, a fish wouldn't have either. I, I may possibly have considered intelligent fish when I was planning that story, but as I say, it was so long ago now, I don't really remember. This was 27 years or so ago, as I recall. Yeah. You wrote most of your short stories early on, didn't you? Yes. Uh, it, it's been a hobby all along. And in the last few years, there somehow seems to have been less and less time. I've been doing more work connected with my profession of high school science teaching. I'm currently president-elect of the New England Association of Chemistry Teachers, and I have an awful feeling that's going to take a lot of my time for the next two and a half years. It sounds like it might take some bunch of your time. Um, I find Needle one of your most fascinating books. In fact, it was one of the first science fiction books that I read you can sort of bracket my age from that point. Yep. But uh, it's been said, by whom I don't know, that, but that a good science fiction mystery couldn't be written. And yes, yet, John Campbell used to make that claim, and I suspect that Needle was written at least partly to uh, try to prove John wrong. Uh, when it was coming out as a serial, he made one of his trips to the greater Boston area. Uh, the first... Uh, of the two parts of the serial was on the stand then, and he began to talk about it to an MIT audience, got a loud scream of, uh, don't, uh, don't give the solution away. He admitted that he was wrong about uh, <laughs> science fiction mysteries not being possible. Yeah. Um, the detective in the needle is a, is a symbiote living uh, in its host body. Yeah. Now that's a really unique idea. How did you formulate that idea? Well, the idea is really not very new. The, the basic notion of what you might call possession has been part of uh, human uh, mythology probably lo since long before we learned to write. And many science fiction stories prior to Needle had had this, that, or the other sort of creature entering the human body and doing various things. The one I can remember most vividly was by uh, Nathan Schachner, a two-part serial called Infra-Universe, which appeared in the December 1936, January 1937 issues of Astounding Stories. One reason that I am that good on the memory is I have the December 36 Astounding open in front of me at the, mor at the moment. I've been reading old collection stuff. And uh, that had virus-like creatures moving into the human body and taking control. Again, I was more materialistic. I didn't think that such a creature could take over uh, as easily as was suggested in some of these stories, and I felt that the hunter would have to have to do quite a job of work before he had any real effect of communication, to say nothing of control, in his host. Yeah, I, uh, all, all during my reading of The Needle, I was wondering, you know, why doesn't he vibrate his ear? And of course, in the sequel, that's what you have him do. Yeah, eventually, yes, the idea was worked out. Well, I have to admit that that idea didn't occur to me until later. Yeah. I will just have to admit that it didn't occur to the hunter either. Aha, yeah. Well, you and the hunter probably go along in the same thought processes as it were. Well, yes. I'm not the sort of craftsman who can uh, come up with a personality totally different from uh, my own and make it sound believable. There are people who are much better at that art than I am. Robert Heinlein, for example can write uh, Stranger in a Strange Land and become practically a god to the hippies and then write Starship Trooper and have everybody thinking he's a Nazi. And this, in my opinion, uh, neither of them uh, reflects his own beliefs. It's simply to show his skill at character portrayal. I can't do that. I can't come close to it. No, but you do the best of you do the best aliens I've ever read. Do you uh, have any authors that you like, or any, any people that you like, who uh, put together good aliens? Well, my favorite, I think, is Paul Anderson, who has done a good deal of this sort of thing, too. We have uh, worked together to a certain extent. We uh, collaborated by mail in putting together the planetary system in which his novel Fire Time took place, 
I supposedly have rights to a few planets in the same system, and if time ever permits, I may write some, may, I may write some stories about them. Aside from aliens, do you have any authors whom you like who write hard science? Or who, who do you think are writing good hard science? Well, Paul still comes to uh, mind, first of all. Arthur Clarke, of course, uh, knows his relevant space science very thoroughly, and he doesn't do silly things like having spaceships fall into the sun when their engines quit. Uh, Isaac Asimov, although he doesn't write very much science fiction now, seldom makes uh, really serious science mistakes in it. Uh, a lot of the new writers, I'm sorry to say I can't uh, cite by name. Several of them are pretty good, uh, but my memory for names is terrible, and it's the start of the school year, and I'm currently trying to learn the names of about 75 students of my own. And I, I can't, some of these young fellows, well, let's see, uh, Alan Dean Foster comes to mind, but unfortunately he's made some rather serious astronomical slips. Uh, who else? Uh, well, names don't come to my mind at the moment, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know, I have the same problem. Um, this is a bit off the beaten track, but on the same question of aliens, have you, has anybody ever put together a good alien for the movies? I haven't seen by any means all of the uh, movie science fiction things. The the one that was called Alien, I gather, was very impressive, but uh, was so mostly by uh, avoiding detailed portrayal of it, of his or its or her nature, which is, of course, is a perfectly good trick. Uh, I can't think of any alien I have seen in a movie who was really believable in character, believably alien. Now, what was his name, Yoder or something like that, and the Empire Strikes Back was funny and good as far as, I guess, as he went. Uh, who else? Now, that's pretty well. Uh, they're the only one, that's the only one I can think of who was very impressive. There were several unnamed species in the, uh, the bar scene, uh, the first of the shows, the, uh, the, the Star Wars, uh, where the disguise was good, the, the arguing back and forth in a completely unintelligible language pr produced a very uh, impressive and funny scene. But again, uh, you can't really tell what the personalities of the creatures were like. They were very much like uh, drunks in a terrestrial bar. I think a good job was done, but I wouldn't say they were really alien. And what do you? I don't know what can be done. The uh, the movie, the the visual uh, field, either movies or TV, represents quite a different problem from the writing one. And I know just enough about it to realize what the difference is. I would question my own ability to write a good TV script or movie script because you are depending a great deal on what the customer sees rather than on uh, the words you can use, the paragraphs you can build to explain what the background situation is. I don't know how that problem is solved, really. Probably with a lot of money. Well, that, that certainly helped. But uh, I don't think money is the whole answer to a problem like that. You need somebody who has not merely an imagination, but a skill in the field. He has to have experience. He has to have knowledge, which I think probably can only come from experience, of what the, those visual media can and can't do, and in what ways, practically, they differ from the written word. And here I'm quite aware of my own limitations, and I, I shouldn't even try to sell what those differences are because most of them I probably don't even recognize. Yeah, I see what you mean now, though. Um, rummage through my list of questions here. Uh, on your current book, Nitrogen Fix, um, without giving away the plot, um, how did you come up with the idea of, of, the, of the Earth where just the oxygen has gone out of the atmosphere, or at least it's bonded with nitrogen. That's right. It, the idea itself is not new. It was used many years ago in a story called The Mightiest Machine by John Campbell, 
which someone invented a catalyst which permitted the direct combination of nitrogen and oxygen to the nitrogen uh, pentoxide. Actually, such a catalyst wouldn't work, apparently, nearly as I've been able to figure out from the available free energies concerned. But with a little juggling and having life forms involved, which can balance off the uh, decrease in free, the increase in free energy in one place with a decrease in another, it seemed possible to me. Also, again, I was more careful quantitatively than John was. He had the snowflakes of uh, nitrogen pentoxide drifting out of the sky and bursting into flame as they hit organic matter and oxidized it, and the red-brown gases that rose when the high oxides of nitrogen got reduced by uh, other things like organics, and the streams fuming as the oxides of nitrogen uh, boiled into them. It was a very impressive book, beautiful adventure story. But unfortunately, there isn't that much oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. You couldn't have made that much uh, dinitrogen uh, pentoxide. And I had to tone everything down a good deal and have the worst of it had happened in the past and try to figure out what the final results would have been, or intermediate results anyway, a couple of thousand years after things had started. But uh, I'd been working on that quantitatively for a long time because I can remember giving a talk on the general subject to a local college uh, somewhere about the winter of 1958-59. Oh, so you, you've been working on the basic outline of this book for a long time. Yes, indeed. Uh, are you working on anything new right now? Are you getting Only in the sense that whenever I think of some idea which might be useful, I stick it on a 3 by 5 card and put it where I can find it again. When the pile of cards gets uh, high enough, I start spreading it out and seeing if uh, they can be put into any sort of rational sequence. School is, has just started in the last couple of weeks, and I really haven't time to do very much of that for a while. won't have for a few months. I won't have time. Well, Christmas vacation will be the first time I can do very much on that line. Uh, was there anything specific that you might want to talk about? I don't know. I get my enthusiasms and my uh, dislikes the same as everyone else, but... Uh, with the political season coming up, I probably shouldn't ir irritate people by talking about them. Most of my strong opinions are either scientific or anti-scientific subjects. I happen to be very uh, pro-nuclear. A lot of my friends are not. I don't know what else I could do. If, if I get started on that, it might go on indefinitely, and you probably wouldn't want that. I, we talked uh, not too long ago with Jack Williamson. We went out to Talos and talked with him for a while. And... Uh, one of the things he was rather adamant on was the fact that he was getting a little tired of some of the ecologists saying, well, listen, we need to do this with wind power and this power and that power, and the fact that uh, no one has ever been harmed in a, in a nuclear accident of any sort. Well, uh, I'm not entirely sure of that. I think if some of the, the military reactors may have caused some trouble, but... Uh quite true as far as I know the commercial ones have not. Uh, the thing that bothers me is that an awful lot of these people uh, offer solar power as though it were the panacea. And a little bit of fairly straightforward arithmetic, uh, starting with the fact that we used something like two trillion kilowatt hours of electricity in 1975, suggests that the minimum amount of solar collecting surface at 15% efficiency, which is about where we are now, which could provide that, and that's making awfully generous allowance for how long in the day the sun is above the horizon and how often we don't have clouds, is something like 1,600 square miles of collector, or roughly the area of the state of Rhode Island. And in those collectors would have to be mounted so they face the sun all the time, which means far enough apart so they didn't shadow each other morning and evening. And... A, I'm very dubious about our being able to build anything like that amount of solar unit in several, within the several decades. I'm even more dubious about our being able to operate it without the usual run of industrial accidents. And I'm a little uh, leery about the suggestion that you could possibly shadow that much countryside with no ecological consequences. Doesn't seem to be a fair trade-off. I'm not saying I, I am in favor of using the sun as much as possible, and uh, certainly even nuclear power won't last forever. But I think that some of its opponents have gotten 
just a little bit unrealistic in, when they start talking about what we should do instead of nuclear. This, this is my opinion. I, I, I could at length defend it quantitatively, but I don't think that's quite what you want on this program. And uh, I just feel fairly strongly about it, and some at least of the anti-nuke stuff I hear is the most incredible bilge. I have to admit some pro-nukers utter bills too, but uh, I don't think there's maybe a selective observation on my part, but I don't think there's quite as much of it from that side. Mm, I, just personally for myself too, I tend to agree with you because I lived outside of town where we run two nuclear power plants all the time. Yeah. And uh, for the most part, nobody thinks anything about it. It seems to me, well, I have a button on my chest right now saying... Uh, a real double standard, anti-nuke signs on cars. The automobile, beyond any argument, is many times more dangerous. Just looking at the box score. And some people say, well, it's not a fair comparison because uh, you can leave the automobile alone if you want. And I question this. I don't think a person who wants to be within reach of such amenities of civilization as grocery stores and library facilities would find it as easy to avoid the automobile as he would to avoid the nuclear power plant. Interesting. Well, since we're not really doing a show on nuclear energy... Right. <laughs> well, you brought me started. I'm sorry. No, that's quite all right. Uh, I hold many of the same views myself. Uh, listen, I appreciate your time very much. Um, we will send you the tape here in about three weeks. Uh, okay. Okay, listen, I appreciate it once more. And, okay. Uh,